Okay, so I'm a huge fan of Procreate. Pretty much all my digital output now is done on this app on the actual iPad. But I thought it's 2020, I've been using the app for years and I wanted to give you just a, a brief sense of what I think are the app's best features. Features that I personally use all the time and are really important to my workflow and I can't imagine using the app without these features now. Now, having said that, the way that you interact with the app may well be very different. And if you've got experience of the app and you've got different things, different features that you think are really important i'd love to hear from you put down in the comments perhaps your best 10 features things that you couldn't live without within the app things that just make such a big difference to the way that you work put those down in the comments and we can start a conversation there too now i've done a full app guide i'm going to put a link at the top if you're not familiar with this app at all and you need to start from the very beginning there is a beginning beginner's guide in addition to that i've also done a full version five of this app because there's been various different updates, a full guide to all the features. It's pretty comprehensive. It tells you about all the different aspects of this latest version of this app. Anyway, that being said, I'm going to give you my top 10 features. So as you can see, I've got one of my paintings on here. And if I just go into this section, which is the layers, you can see here that layers are crucial to the way that I work. Now the layers can work really simply for you. You can add layers, you can uh, delete layers, you can do various different things. You can merge down layers, you can combine down layers, all sorts of separate features within them. But just the very fact that you can create layers work so far on one layer and then you can create another layer and carry on working on top just for the sake of being able to experiment further on a separate layer without interfering with the layer underneath is just completely important and changes the way that you think about your painting and your artwork i think when you're working traditionally and you're used to having to be very cautious um, anything that you apply to your artwork you need to be quite sure about if you are already at a stage with your art that you're quite happy with it whereas in digital you can just experiment 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 and if it goes wrong it's on a separate layer anyway if you've you know kept track of it and it really has no consequence you can delete the layer you can do all sorts of different things or just turn the opacity down on the layer for example so click on the layer on here and you can turn the opacity down um, you can also switch the layers off rearrange them if you're happy that you've got two layers and you think that they're working correctly and they're on the same kind of layer properties you can just pinch and merge them together too now as you saw briefly then i clicked on a different layer so for example i'll click on this layer and the layer properties if you click on the little letter symbol there it's currently on screen but within the different scroll down options there you've got all sorts of different ways that you can set that layer to interact with the rest of the image now you could spend a long time basically explaining some of the different features on here i'm not really going to do that but all I'm going to just briefly show you is that actually you can experiment. So if you've got a layer and you've put a certain of you know colors and effects on there, it's worthwhile sometimes just scrolling down and just seeing what the different layer properties actually do for your image. Now, for example, if I set it to normal, this was the kind of color scheme that I came up with originally. So I put the layer in. It was quite traditional. It had the, the whites, the orange, the yellows, um, and the reds at the outer sort of extremes of the shape, which looks fine if you put it on a black background. But as soon as you start putting other effects onto other layers, you might find, for example, that that red looks too saturated for something that's supposed to be in the distance. So I wanted to keep all the light effects for example, on this particular feature, keep all the luminosity, keep the general color sense, but I wanted to perhaps just subdue some of the, you know, the saturated colors. So what I do, I mean, I was kind of aware of this anyway, so I didn't need to sort of hunt around for the right le uh, layer property too much. I know that if I go onto screen, it does tend to screen out a lot of the saturation of the color, but it preserves the kind of luminous sense, the light, the effect of it, and it, it really helps sort of blend it in with the other layers that you also have going off there. Sometimes I know very specifically, like I, I described, I know that screen helps with this kind of effect, but sometimes I'll just experiment when I've got complicated layers and kind of light effects going on. I'll just go down, I'll scroll through them just to see if there's a different kind of effect that might just be a bit of a happy accident. And sometimes that's really brought out some really interesting features that I've preserved and I've kept in my actual finished painting. So yeah, my number one feature on Procreate is the ability uh, to use layers and all the different features that come within layers just make this such an important part of, I think, pretty much anyone's workflow within Procreate. Now, feature two is crop and resize. This is a new feature in Procreate uh, 5. 
and it's a really it's just a fantastic addition to the, the rest of the, the features really um it's something that you can't do with a traditional canvas obviously when you start with a, a painting and you've got a canvas it's a physical thing you cannot change the size of it certainly not not in, in any way that is uh, practical anyway whereas now digitally on procreate if you started off with an image similar to what i started off with here so i had a specific image uh, i didn't really like the background i wanted to expand upon that and then that particular feature became this small area of this larger canvas so all you really have to do is you go to the the wrench or the spanner symbol here crop and resize and then you can either crop it down so that you're just focusing on a specific detail or you can change the shape of it completely maybe you wanted to sort of expand it out here and every time I do this it just gives me more ideas I mean even now when I'm relatively happy with that kind of canvas I'm close to completing this painting but just simply by rethinking about the format of that canvas it, it inspires me to, to think of it in a different way so even now I'm looking at this as an option and I'm starting to imagine these shapes continuing and what impact that would have to the rest of the painting. Who knows, maybe maybe at this point I've changed my, my perspective on the painting and I'll carry on working into that new area that I can then create. I don't think I'm going to, but it just shows you that the power of being able to see it from a different perspective by resizing it. I'm gonna cancel that for now though. So yeah, the cropping and resizing is a new feature for Procreate 5 but really, really useful and just helps you really focus in, continue a piece of work. So even if you've got it to a certain proportions, you don't have to merge all the layers and flatten it as an image and opening it in a new canvas. You can preserve all the layers that are here even after you've resized your canvas. So I could have done exactly as I've shown you there, make it a much different proportioned canvas but all these layers and all the information on each of those layers would have been kept. It wouldn't have flattened the image, which is really crucial. Now the next feature, and this is an, a relatively new feature for Procreate, and that is Liquify. I really love the Liquify tool. Now I'm gonna show you an example of how I've actually used it within this painting, just to give it some context. So I have this layer here that has those features on it. Now I started off with a, a certain area here, and I think it was just this area in fact, as I remember. And rather than having to start from scratch and redraw everything, I copied and pasted that layer back in. I flipped it, I expanded and make it bigger. But then an additional thing that you can do, so it doesn't look exactly like a copy. And I'll, I'll copy it again, just to really help you understand what I'm saying here. So let's just say that I've got that additional layer and you can see just by looking at a glance that it's obviously duplicated because it's the same kind of shapes. Whereas if you go into the Liquify tool, you've got various different tool sets here that help you push manipulate it around. So perhaps you can change the look of it so it's not as obviously duplicated. So you can see here on the second version, I'm just gonna be allowed to actually alter it, but you can see I can push it around. I mean, this is the most basic fundamental part of what you might want to use it for, to actually push it around and change those shapes. And you can see within just a few moments, you can end up with something up here that looks pretty separate from what it used to look like down there. Now there's various different ways you can do that. You can see some of them are more useful than others. So you've got the brush size that you can turn up and down, you can sort of twirl it left and right. If you've got a detail that you like or you wanna make it bigger you can or smaller, you can pinch it in or you can expand it out. You can do something what's called edge here and it just brings it down to the straight line, whatever you're drawing. And, and basically just play around with the different sort of manipulation tools that you've got within uh, Liquify. So this is a tool that I do use increasingly now. Although it's a relatively new feature, I've already really found a good application for it and I'm starting to integrate it into my workflow rather a lot because a lot of my paintings do have quite abstract kind of elemental features. So it'll be fire, water, cloud, smoke, all these different things that, that don't have a specific shape to begin with. And so pushing it and manipulating it around can really work well and you just start to find new things with by doing that and using that process. Okay, the next feature that I'm going to talk about is the ability to freehand select an area uh, and then do various different things with that. So for example, if you go onto this selection area and you have the different settings, the one that I personally prefer to use is the freehand. Now, you, if you're looking for something that is just a general area, and you're quite happy to go with that and you just want to select everything in that general area then that one perhaps will do 
but typically when I'm using it and I find the most valuable is to use the freehand. And then simply all you would have to do if you're on the layer that has the information is to go and draw around, sorry, if you click on it, you have to go back on. So once you're on the freehand, draw around the area that you want to do something with. So I've selected the area, I'll three fingers down and I'll copy and paste it. And then it's created that element on a separate layer. Now, obviously that layer is gonna default to the kind of normal settings. So if I wanted to have a similar effect, like I was explaining before, I'd have to put it on something like screen. And then I can move just those singular elements. I can expand it, I can move it around, I can put it onto a different area, and I can achieve lots of different effects just by being able to freehand select a specific detail that I want to duplicate, I want to distort, I want to do something with. Now the next feature is the ability to put in an image from your photo or your saved images. So if you go into the spanner wrench symbol, um, you've got an, an option to add. You can insert or take a photo at this point. So if you insert a photo, you can then go through all your different photos and you can put them in to your image. So let's just say there's a detail that I wanted to add to my image. I can put it in here. I can put it anywhere that I want, like so. Now, obviously this particular image I'm showing you here doesn't really fit, but it's an example of the kind of thing that you can do. So this could be really useful. Working digitally, um, it's really flexible in as much as you can take elements from older digital paintings or other digital work, add them as a, a photo file and just sort of edit them and merge them in with everything else that you're doing. I don't do a lot of recycling within my work, but certainly at times it may be that I just want to put in a, a sky picture that I've done for a tutorial video, or I've just done for the fun of it at, at a previous time, and I'm looking for the just the sky that will kind of blend in. So I'll select that from my photo images, I'll put it in as a background layer, and then I'll just make it fit in with the rest of it. So that can be a really crucial, really important way uh, to work sometimes for me. Okay, number six. Another really important feature of Procreate for me is the ability to use an existing image uh, to start to put together, to piece together a color palette. Now, you'll see here, I've got a color palette that is actually a color palette from one of my painting tutorials. But if I wanted to create a new color palette, I'll go into palettes, I'll create a new one, set it as default, then go back to my colors. You'll see I've got a blank area now that I can start to create my color palette. So for example, if I were to put in a painting or an image rather from a different area, I'm just gonna put in one of my landscape pictures here. I'll put it straight to the top just so it's less confusing. It's got less debris interfering with it. So just imagine this was a photo or any kind of reference material that you wanted to piece together a color palette for. All you need to do to do that using what's called a color dropper or the eyedropper. It's very similar to what you would actually use in Procreate. Is it in it? Photoshop rather, is that you can actually press and hold a little bit, find the color area that you actually want. So for example, if I'm doing this range of colors for the sky, I might go to the darkest blue and I might put that in here and I may want to have a kind of transition. So I'll go to the middle point, go there, I'll go to the lower point and put there. It may also be the absolute lowest point down there. So maybe a range of four colors is gonna help me actually start to construct that kind of sky area. And then, for example, might want to pick some of the other colors from this image to piece together areas for the mountains. Now, as you can see, they're quite similar to those other areas, but sometimes it's just useful to separate them for different elements, just so you can really get to grips with what colors go where. And likewise, you can start to put together different colors for your different features quite quickly. You can, you can really put together a really useful set of colors that's really gonna help you get started with your painting. That is something I use all the time. For example, things like my landscape tutorial paintings, I will find a reference image of some sort. I will kind of use that for the colors, construct a color palette. Then at least I know the colors are going to be the right kind of effect. So I may change the composition completely. I'll change, put things in different areas, completely rearrange it, but at least I know the colors are going to work well together and gonna to go and look naturalistic. So when I do a landscape tutorial like this, I do actually share the hexadecimal code so that you can piece them together like this. And I also, for my patrons over at Patreon, I do actually share the file of the color palette for those people there too. So the ability to create a color palette, to use the 
colour dropper to actually start to construct a colour palette is just something that is so useful, I use it all the time. Now the next feature is actually very closely related to the last one and it is actually the colour history section. So I've already identified that you can create your colour palette ahead of time but whilst you're actually working on areas it might be that you know you found a particular area here that has been achieved through various different layers merging over the top of each other and so you didn't have that colour in your colour palette initially, but you've ended up with that colour effect just by the different layers working over the top of each other. But now you find a, a colour you really like and you want to do more of that colour somewhere else on your canvas, perhaps on a layer that hasn't got a different effect on it. So for example, up here, where you just wanted to add more of it into a very closely related area. So having it there in your history could be really useful. So you can see I've used it there. I may then go on to another colour now it's added that colour, I use several different colours. You can see it's keeping a record of the last few different colours. So it may be I'm a few colours on and I just want to go back and alternate between, as you can see I've done here, between a colour I've just done most recently and okay, I haven't saved it in the colour palette, but it is saved here in my history. That's a new feature to the colour palette kind of options and I think it's a really important feature and it's one that I'm beginning to use. Obviously it's a new feature so I've not had a chance to use it very often but it is something now that I'm starting to you know work into my workflow and I can see it becoming a really important feature if you remember that it's actually there. So the next one is going to be the quick shape tool. So you can see here I was going for a rough kind of oval shape. My initial version of it was pretty rubbish, but if you press and hold at the end of that shape, so you don't release the Apple Pencil, you just hold it at the end of your shape, you can see here it snaps to, it approximates what you're what you're trying to do. Um, but you can edit it further and you can sort of change it like that. Obviously doing something that is perhaps arguably more like a circle, it generally speaking will guess that. And obviously those two versions are not enough like a circle, so I'll have another go at that. Yeah. You can see it's given me a circle option now. So once I've clicked on the circle, I can then expand it from anywhere on the circle. I can move it to somewhere else on my canvas, but you'll notice it's got these little blue points on it. As soon as I drag it from one of those, it then changes it to an ellipse. And now that can be the same for any kind of shape. So whether it's a triangle, whether it's a square or a rectangle, you can see it does the same thing. And obviously a straight line. Really useful tool. I think people use that a great deal. Another feature that people will probably want to use a lot is the turn on drawing assist. You've got edit drawing and you've got various different things that you can use here. You can create perspective, whether you can see that very clearly, turn the opacity of it up and the thickness of the lines you can probably see. I'm creating perspective points on that canvas. You can create symmetry, you can create grids, you can create isometric sort of grids. The assisted kind of drawing is really useful. So once you've done that as well, and then you're perhaps working on a layer, you can turn on the drawing assist and you can see here, it only really allows you to draw things that kind of run parallel with those drawing guides. So if you're doing really perspective sort of cityscapes or, or 3D kind of shapes that need to lock into certain straight lines and perspectives, then that's going to be a really useful tool for you as well. Okay, uh, number 10 is the ability to blur certain areas. So for example, if on my canvas, I'm going to go back to this whole image actually, because it's just easier to show you on an image that's flattened on, for example. I might have an area on my canvas that I'm happy with, but I want certain features. Now I've done this manually here. You can see it's a little bit less in focus. If you're thinking in terms of like photography and depth of field, then it may be that you want a certain area in focus, but anything beyond that depth of field, you want to be out of focus. It's a really good effect for creating a little bit more sense of, of realism or more kind of photographic kind of photographic look to your work. So you can go into here, you can go into Gaussian Blur, you can slide it along and you can see that it's just really blurred out that section compared to another feature. So this is something that generally speaking, I will do at a, an end point within my painting. Um, I prefer to do the details first and take it to a degree, perhaps it isn't necessary, but I prefer to have the details there. And then I, even if I've blurred them, so you don't see those details, somehow I think it adds the, the kind of believability to the sense of what's going off there in the distance. Now, obviously you can do that to a greater or lesser extent. You can just blur it just a little bit and uh, maybe that works a little bit better. So for me, for me personally, I don't always use it, but when I use it, I use it to really push things to the foreground, push things into the background, create that sense of perspective and distance, 
and I find it's been incredibly useful, a really important feature. And obviously within the blurs, you've got a motion blur if you want to really create a dynamic sense of things moving. You've got perspective blur, so you can exaggerate perspectives within your work. But generally, I'll just use the kind of Gaussian blur, keep it quite straightforward. But yeah, you've got lots of options, even within the blur. The first one that I personally think is absolutely crucial is to go into preferences. You go into your gesture controls, you go into general, and I've disabled all my touch actions. So if I undo that and I don't disable it, you can now see that I can draw with my finger. But the negative part of that is that I could accidentally touch it with my knuckles or any sort of side part of my finger. And you can see when I'm not actually drawing, if I'm making contact, I'm actually adding to my image in a ways that I don't want to. And unfortunately, if you're on the eraser tool and you start doing that, or the brief and the brush tool, or, the, or any of the actual tools that you can use, you're gonna start affecting your image in ways that perhaps you didn't intend to. So the first thing that I would recommend you do, is you go into gesture controls, general, go into this section, disable touch actions, and then it's impossible to draw on that screen now. The only thing that can draw on it is the Apple Pencil itself. So that's my first big tip. The next tip, again, within preferences, is to go to the edit pressure curve and it will start off with this straight line default. But what that means is that you have to press on quite hard before it will actually start to do anything. So you can be lightly pressing on and it hardly does anything. To get anything decent appearing onto your uh, canvas, you have to be pressing on what feels like quite a lot. So what I would suggest you do is you change that curve at the beginning, make it quite steep at that beginning section. I mean, I've done it made it too complicated really. All you really need to do is perhaps pitch it at the beginning like that so it runs quite steep. And then even when you're pressing quite lightly now, you're going to start to notice it having an effect much earlier and it's gonna feel more natural as if this was an actual pencil on your screen. It makes a big difference. I really recommend that you go and change that. The last little tip that I think I have, if you're a traditional artist, now people that actually go and sit out in the landscape um, would often take with them a little mirror. Now what they would do with that mirror is they would actually look through the mirror to look at their own canvas, to see their canvas from a different perspective. By flipping it, by looking at a mirror image of it, you get a better sense of your overall composition and whether the composition as a whole is working well. Now, one of the ways that you can do that on here, if I go back, I go back up to canvas, is just to flip it horizontally. You can see the whole image, you can feel then whether perhaps that you, you know, the general way that you're working is, is weighting it too heavily in one direction. Now I've noticed on some of my earlier works that I couldn't do that, and um, that were traditional paintings, uh, traditional drawings, and when I look at a mirror image of it, it seems really strangely kind of weighted towards one side. It seems to perhaps be my natural kind of weighting of the way that I work, the kind of movements I make because I'm right-handed. I felt it look really awkward and really strange when I flipped it around. Now, partly that could be because you're not used to seeing it in reverse, but actually I feel that the composition didn't work as well either. So what I will do now, whilst I'm in the middle of a painting, is just every now and again, flip the canvas horizontally, perhaps work on it from that perspective, just for a short while, just to, to get a feel for it and feel whether everything seems to be sitting right from this perspective before then I put it back to the original perspective and carry on working. And I find just by, by doing that every now and again, I'm creating a composition that works overall and I, I'm not losing sight of what I'm actually working on. Anyway, so that's the last few tips that I've got and that's all my best features mentioned. So if you've got a different top 10 or different kind of tips that you want to put down in the comments for everyone to read or to start a conversation with me, then please feel free to do that. There's going to be a new tutorial coming extremely soon. So remember to subscribe. If you want to support me over at Patreon, there is a link for that down in the description. Otherwise, I shall catch you back here soon. See you later.